coming off from deep in the Earth mantle fuels Yellowstone's geysers and hot springs. So I'll kind of outline it this. I'll do an overview in geologic setting. I talk about shaking and baking. Have to talk about those features in Yellowstone. Then I'll talk about our new four dimensional structure of Old Faithful. And I'll end up by saying a few words about the California earthquakes not triggering Yellowstone, <coughs> in spite of what you've seen on the press. Well, first of all, <laughs> my presentation is a result of many, many years of research. I began in Yellowstone in 56, and I worked for Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Uh, the Park Service, etc. So I got a chance to experience and study the Hebgen Lake earthquake magnitude 7.5 and I'm in my 63rd year of working in Yellowstone. And I just want to comment that my work has been associated with a lot of students and fellow scientists and I've been supported, you know, by Park Service, National Science Foundation, USGS, etc. And these parks have been greatly supportive, and I thank geologists of Jackson Hole for inviting me. This is the emblem for our, my research group at the University of Utah, Seismology and Active Tectonics. I formed the University of Utah Seismograph Station, which now encompasses the entire Intermountain region, including the Teton Network. Of course, I worked with the Park Service, again, for decades, the National Science Foundation. This is an organization, EarthScope, which I was the chair and instigator of how this organization actually developed. I worked for the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. I helped found the Teton Science Schools, and I'm gratified to having support from some of these individual research foundations. So, my combination is 40, 50, 60, 70, 100. <laughs> well, it's 40 really means 44 years ago, I helped found the Teton Science Schools with Ted and Joan Major. 50 years ago now, 53, I've noted I'm at the university 63 years now in Yellowstone. I began right out of high school, actually in the winter, and I've supervised 70 graduate students. And if you add up all my graduate students and senior theses and postdocs, close to 100. So I've had a very rich career of people who I've had great fun teaching and doing research and working with all of these great scientists. Well, first of all, let's make sure where Yellowstone is. It's in the northwest corner of Wyoming, as if you didn't know. But it's important to recognize in plate tectonic theory, there's four basic elements. There's one called the transform fault. That happens to be the San Andreas, or an example is the San Andreas, where the Pacific plate is sliding along against North America and subduction zones in the Pacific Northwest where the Juan de Fuca plate is diving down beneath the North American continent. And the basin and range between Salt Lake City and Reno, 800 miles wide, is extending at about an inch to two inches per year today. But I want to focus on hotspot. In this case, I'll talk about Yellowstone. And then interestingly, most hotspots are in oceanic settings. Yellowstone's 1,500 kilometers from the plate boundary or from the west coast. Nonetheless, it's an important element of plate tectonics. Now, I just want to make sure you understand, many of you do, that I tend to integrate a lot of information. So this little complicated picture here means I look at data clear into the Earth's mantle, which produces magma that comes to the surface and related heat flow. It produces ground deformation at the surface. It stresses the earth and makes earthquakes. It fuels hydrothermal and volcanic features. And at the top of the chart is the Yellowstone volcano field, which I'm going to talk more about. So if we start down here in the Earth's mantle, this is a two-dimensional image clear down to 1,000 uh, kilometers. Magma rises, not vertically. The Earth's core is way down here but it rises along this conduit uh, that's shown in red, meaning high temperature and very low seismic velocity, and that's how we map it. 
Well, it comes to the, near the surface, so the top of the mantle plume would be right down in here. And fuels, sends magma through the Earth's crust into a lower crustal magma body that's at a depth of about 30 miles. Top is about 20. And then this in turn sends magma of rhyolitic composition to near the surface beneath and creates the Yellowstone caldera. And this is the feature of which most people think about as the Yellowstone magma chamber. It's not such a thing as a magma chamber. These are reservoirs. There ain't no holes in the ground down there. There ain't no chambers. And when you put fluids into this body, you expand the surface. And this is a contour map from satellite measurements where each contour boundary here is about four, well, it's about an inch. And that's, this happens being 2003 to 2008. That was a nice image. So, and of course, this is the uplift of the Yellowstone caldera. So these features all work together. And I want to remind folks that much of what I'm showing you, not all my new stuff, is in my book, uh, Windows into the Earth, The Geology of Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks. That book is very popular. It sold 40,000 copies now. And it is the most popular geology book in the parks. Um, in a broader scale, this is a map showing with these red dots the intermountain seismic belt, that is, seismicity begins down near Las Vegas, comes up through central Utah, and then goes into southeastern Idaho, western Wyoming, over to central Idaho, and forms this parabolic shaped zone, and then diffuse seismicity continues on all the way to the Canadian border. So we're down here in Jackson Hole. Here's this diffuse seismicity coming in from the south west. Notably, the Teton Fault, which is right here, which forms on the west side of the Teton Range, and that's the Valley of Jackson Hole, of course, uh, is relatively quiescent. It's quiet. And we think it's in a seismic gap, and I'll mention more of that later. And then earthquake zones continue north into Yellowstone. And this one I'll show you is just an extension of the Teton Fault. It's just now covered by about a mile of young rhyolitic volcanics. And then I'll talk about this big earthquake, Hebgen Lake, Montana, shown at the star. That's the Hebgen Lake earthquake in August 1959 that killed 28 people. So just reminding you, this is the overall story that we're dealing with. Fluids, magma, partial melts, come from the plume. They fuel the lower Yellow, Yellowstone magma reservoir, which in turn fuels the upper reservoir. And fluids get shallowest to the northeast. That's up at northeast of the Yellowstone caldera, as shallow as we think of two to three, even four kilometers. Those are dominantly hydrothermal fluids, gases, hot water, steam, etc., not magma. So, <laughs> Going to the bigger picture, we're up here, and uh, we're going to start with this map showing in yellow with numbers inside. These are millions of years, and with each one of these yellow areas, there could are multiple Yellowstone super eruptive calderas. Some of these have had a dozen or 20 at a time. But look at the age, 16, 14, 12, 11, 10, 7, 6, 4, 1, and the youngest are at Yellowstone, which is basically telling us that the North American plate is driving across a source in the upper mantle of heat and magma. And so the, Yellowstone, the North American plate and its motion tells us about the track of the hotspot back for 600 miles to northwestern or southeastern uh, Oregon. And this, of course, shows the seismicity contemporarily. These are the red dots. There's about 40,000 dots on here. And uh, this is a parabolic shape. So 
think about this as the bow wave of a boat as you're driving across Jackson Lake. And this is the bow wave or the track of the stress in the earth left by the passage of the North American plate over the hotspot. Well, here I want to get just as shortly to outline the first Yellowstone major eruption 2.06 million years ago. It's outlined here. It would have been a, be Caldera number one. Number two is Island Park at 1.3 million years. And finally, what we call the Yellowstone Caldera is 640,000 years old. Now, so the time since the last event was 640,000 years. The average inter-event time is 710,000 years ago. So we're still 70,000 years away. But this, this is only two or three numbers are highly misleading. And don't believe me or anyone else that we can predict the next eruption of Yellowstone. We just don't have the information that we can use for that kind of, of numbers, although we have it very well covered now with seismographs and GPS systems, which I'll mention later. This was my idea of what a super eruption looked like. It's from my book earlier on, actually. This would be looking south toward the Tetons. This would be the Yellowstone Plateau. When it erupted violently, you can see I tried to depict the actual hot magma coming out principally around this ring fracture zone. And when this material comes out, it rises to 80,000 feet. Now, most of magma in any explosive eruption even rises up and then falls back down into the earth. It doesn't spread itself out like the cartoons like to make it. But the eruptive volume of this material was 2,500 cubic kilometers. That's enough to cover the Grand Canyon twice. Next time you think about how big the Grand Canyon is in volume, we can fill it up twice. The eruptions erupt and begin along the fracture zone. They can last for weeks and months, and perhaps even years. When they do so, with this material rising to 80,000 feet, it gets captured in the jet stream. And when it gets captured in the jet stream, of course, it creates a large temperature decrease as much as 9 degrees centigrade, so let's say 12 degrees Fahrenheit. And that creates global volcanic winters. Well, my idea of hydrothermal features, which are geysers, hot springs, and fumaroles, is depicted in my model right here. If you have a source of heat, heat rises, and I'll talk about where it comes from later. It interacts with a layer of saline water at a depth of only maybe a kilometer, kilometer and a half, and creates these little convection cells. That saline water is more dense than fresh surface water, which is derived from rainfall and snow, etc. So we create little convection cells in the surface. They feed. Old Faithful, the hot springs and the geysers. And here's a map of where they're all located. They're dominantly within the caldera. And you can see here's the Old Faithful area in the upper geyser basin, midway and lower geyser basin. There's the Norris Mammoth Corridor of hot springs all the way to Mammoth Hot Springs. And to the northeast, I want to point out it's this area right here, it's called Hot Springs Basin, and it's the biggest geyser, excuse me, hot spring system in the entire world. And if you want to go in there, it's a 25 mile horseback ride from the south or from the north. And I'll talk more, show you some pictures of that feature. Well, I have to show some geysers just to remind you. <laughs> this is the iconic old faithful. This was taken at 45 below zero when I was working with Rick Hutchinson, the park geologist at the time. Here's Guardian in the Midway Geyser Basin. And Beehive is further down. And these are iconic features. These are what Yellowstone is really known for. 
But if you go all the way into that hot springs basin, and it's going to show you, this is a picture looking down into hot springs basin. And this feature is about a mile, a mile to two miles long and about a mile and a half wide. And all the yellow that's coming out here is active deposition of sulfur coming out of holes with hot steam rising out violently, it sounds like a jet airplane if you put your ear down. But it's actually depositing native sulfur on the ground surface. And if you go down all the way to Wad Creek, anyone been down here? It's called Totem Forest. That's what Rick Hutchins and I named it. These are these vertical spires of mineral silicon di center that comes up along the conduit and just water comes up, keeps depositing itself and creating the totem forest. Now if you ever want to get there, it's a hard way in uh, and it's a long way in, but I would highly recommend people that are interested in this is probably one of the most remote places in Yellowstone. Well, I've got a chance to see it close up several different features in Yellowstone. This is a picture of Steamboat Geyser, which erupted in July 6, 1984. It's the largest geyser in the world, and we get hot water rising from, as you can see, near the surface. Jets of hot water are coming out here almost supersonically. This is hot water, this is steam, and this is a mist. And we think it comes from a reservoir of 300 degrees temperature centigrade. Now, it used to erupt every five to 10 years for 20 to 30 minutes, but it's erupted, I have seven times in this past three years. That's gonna be updated now to nearly 50. I'm gonna talk more about this. It's really erupting now at a much higher rate. It's the only known aerial photograph of Yellowstone. I was flying, I was out of fuel, and I was out of slide film. This is my last slide. We had about 10 pounds of fuel left to get back to West Yellowstone. So how lucky could I be? <laughs> Chances of me taking this picture is one in 150 million. Those are real probabilities, huh? Don't bet on it. Here's Black Opal Pool in Lower Geyser, Midway Geyser Basin, you can see these are hot springs, fumaroles, and I happened to be leading a field trip there in 2009, and we stopped and looked back over the, the area, and I had just said, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions are very rare, and the park geologist said, hydrothermal eruptions are very rare. <laughs> <laughs> That's 20 feet behind me. That's an eruption of Walpool in the Opal Basin. You can see it's, it's blowing out ejecta, and these are rocks that we later, later measured of several inches in diameter. And so this explosive eruption then emits a lot of hot water that then flows down in a gradient toward the Firehole River. When I, I had my back toward it, because I was looking here, and all these people had their cameras out taking pictures. I heard it, and I thought the explosion was a truck. Not supposed to be park service, or any other trucks over there. I instantaneously said, shall I save my field trip members? Can I run and grab my camera? Or, well, fortunately, it stopped within a few seconds. But that's my next, or one of my last greatest experiences. Now let me go back to, to the south and let's look at the Tetons for a little bit before I move on to Old Faithful. I just want to explain the Teton range, of course, are spectacular. And what makes the Teton grand? That's the question we always ask. Looking down, we see 7,000 feet of vertical relief. Here's the Snake River coming down toward uh, this is the Triangle X. And so we have this great mountain range and a relatively flat body. And I'll talk about that a little bit, except to say mountains rise and the valley has fallen during thousands and thousands of magnitude seven earthquakes and larger along the Teton Fault, which is at the base of the mountain range right here. 
in just the last probably seven million years now within some new data that just come out. So here's a map showing color. This is the Teton Range and it consists of Precambrian rocks of granites and granodiorites. I won't get into the detailed geology, but we mapped the Teton Fault. It wasn't mapped until we finished it in 1970. And it begins down near Wilson, comes to the north, splays to the left, uh, as you can see actually beneath Mount Moran, and then the next segment continues across Jackson Lake, and of course here's the valley of of Jackson Hole. And it's mostly composed on the surface of very, very young alluvium gravels, etc. But these same rocks that are here in the mountain block are out here at a depth of about 20,000 feet or more. So the Teton Range is right here with the Teton Fault. And I plotted the Teton Fault again, but I've also plotted two other things. I plotted the crest of the Teton Range as the peaks. And I plotted in the back the topographic boundary of Jackson Hole. That is, the Teton Range is moving so fast that the topography in the highest points of fluid flow is behind to the west of the Teton Fault by a couple of kilometers. So this gives us, scientists that said, this is happening because it's moving so fast. And so I just plotted here the amount of offset in the last 15,000 years against this profile. This is looking south to north. And you can see the youngest displacement on the Teton Fault, which is in the last 16,000 years since the last glaciation, because we can't map it before that. And you can see these are the heights of the scarp of the Teton Fault, uh, as high as 20 meters up near Mount Moran and the Grand Teton. <coughs> so what is an earthquake? Well, think of taking a rubber band, a big one, pulling it apart, and when you pull it apart so hard it breaks snap. That's what the earth does exactly. So we take the earth's upper few kilometers which is very brittle and we start to stretch it. And that's called loading and then we find the rupture and the rupture only lasts for a few seconds and it relieves its stress and goes back down. Well this cycle of loading earthquake loading earthquake repeats itself every few thousand years. And we can measure this because we have very accurate GPS that measures the ground motion between the mountain block and the valley block. So what we like to plot, well first of all, I made, I've looked at observed deformation from big earthquakes, Dixie Valley, Nevada, Bora Peak, Idaho, and Hebgen Lake, Montana. And these are the ground Con plots of profile of how the ground has dropped down while their respective mountain blocks are these little tiny things here. In other words, 80% of the valley goes down, the Teton Range only goes up 20%. And this is actually a mathematical model of a brittle layer 16 kilometers long which fix the Jackson Hole data. So everybody says, oh, the Tetons are rising. Oh, yeah. No, the valley's dropping. It's just that it gets covered in with alluvium and other materials. So where is the Teton Fault? It's just along the base of the range, just above Lupin Meadows, Jenny Lake. It wraps around, comes up west of String Lake, and it puts this beautiful scarp you can see from the String Lake parking lot, if you wish. So the fault is right here. You can really see it in this picture here, here, and here. So the fault's not out in the valley and it's not up on the mountain range. It's right where the topography breaks because you've raised the core granitic blot above the valley block. And that's what it looks like next time you're at Spring Lake. That's the fault scar. 80 feet high in about 14,000 years. 
Now, <laughs> that doesn't all happen at once. It happens about once every few hundreds of years, but there's probably been five magnitude seven and a half earthquakes about one every 2,600 years. And by the way, we're now 2,000 years overdue. <laughs> or 15 Bora Peak earthquakes was a magnitude three. And you can see this is a picture taken looking at the same feature. There's the fault scarp, top of Woodchuck Peak. Or Rock Chuck, I mean. So we get out of this a beautifully uplifted fault block tilting to the west, which you can maybe I'll go to red. Tilting to the west along the Teton Fault which of course is the active feature of geology and the Jackson Hole Valley is just basically a filled in hole with gravels and alluvium etc that come from the Grovant, from the Snake River etc etc. Now Teton earthquakes, <laughs> I told you we were very surprised when we started doing our very detailed earthquake studies there weren't any earthquakes here. So. This is a seismic gap, and it's well known in geology world, but the Teton Fall is right here and it dips to the east, 45 degrees all the way, the bottom of it is clear to the east side of the valley. I always say it's right beneath Teton Science School, <laughs> which it is. As I say, there are few earthquakes, however, that align themselves. Here's a cross section. And these are the earthquakes. Here's the Teton Fault. And you'd think the earthquakes would be clustered around this fault. They're not clustered at all. They're spread out diffusely in the Earth's crust from about five kilometers to 15 kilometers. But the fault's quiescent, a seismic gaps, and seismic gaps always fill in. One of the great things about Jackson Hole is you can see from the east side of the valley to the west side of the valley and what we find is the west side of the valley against the Teton Fault shown here in these profiles is lower than the east side of the valley. So these are profiles, you know, starting, here's profile B, D, A. Here's the Snake River. Here's Fish Creek at Wilson. Snake River is 12 feet higher or snake, then Fish Creek. Why do I say that? Because if this ever breaks on the dikes, guess where the water's going? It doesn't go uphill, it goes downhill. And this is profile C, clear down here. If you put them all together, they all look the same. The valley is tilting actively to the west today accompanied or produced by large earthquakes and post-seismic deformation. Now we put in a trench across the fall here. We put a trench and we dug a trench with a backhoe so we could cut open the earth and look into its sides. And right here is where the actual fault is. So the upthrown side, which are all these units, are older rocks than on the east side, which is all this alluvium, and we actually log this in detail to the nearest centimeter. I won't go into the details, these data are all published, but we found an earthquake 1.8 meters of offset 7,300 years ago. We found a younger one between 4,700 years and 6,000 years ago. It was a magnitude seven, it was one meter of offset but we know these large earthquakes repeat themselves about every 800 years in the Yellowstone Teton system. And the last one was 4,700 years ago. <laughs> We're way overdue. You can actually plot the displacement versus time. These are the ones that we, here's today, and here the, we measured two meters of offset Here's 1.3 meters, 2.8. So from the last event, 7,900 years ago, back to 14,000, the fault was going at two millimeters per year. Now you wonder, is that really fast? 
that's actually very fast in geologic time. But it's slowed down a bit now, around 0 0.16. But we know that these are earthquakes that had to have occurred in prehistoric time to make up for that offset here of about nine uh, meters. Here's what we do with GPS. These are not toys. These are geodetic grade dual receivers and they're mounted in a antenna. The data are transmitted in real time back to the University of Utah and another sister facility. Here's one at Ditch Creek, Teton Science School is back here and the, there's Teton Science School. Moran Junction, we put in a seismic and a GPS. We have one at Moose Ponds. The next time you're walking around Moose Ponds, you're probably gazing out to the east, but look up above you and you'll see one of these instruments. So we're right on top of the fault. What we discovered was that we expected the valley to be going down, the mountain to be coming up, and if you fix this mountain block, we found that the whole valley of Jackson Hole was rising, as you can see in these vertical arrows. Totally unexpected. Should be going down. Moreover, these arrows are going from right to left, right to left. So the Jackson Hole block is pushing into the Teton block. And that's what locks it. Because when you put compressive pressure on two pieces of brittle material, you push them hard, they won't move. That's why we have a seismic gap. But I won't go into those details. Because that's what we end up with, Jackson Hole Valley. These are the Precambrian rocks that are up here at the top of the mountain range. So, let me talk to you about our latest fun, if you wish, unusual feature. We've been doing seismic imaging of Old Faithful Geyser. It has never been done before. Of course, this is Old Faithful, and this is my group. We work with the Park Service and a company that builds the new seismographs I'll show you, and we had a colleague from the University of Texas, El Paso. Um, this is what the new instruments look like. They're called nodal, N-O-D-A-L, and they're autonomous, meaning they stand by themselves. You just walk out, shove it in the ground, and walk away. They have their own self-recording, their own GPS clock, radio receivers, and memory, and they can run from about two to four months, depending on the battery you put in them. Here's one right out in front of the old faithful inn, just, well, stick it in the ground. Well, the problem is... How many walk away? None. No, we do this, so, we do this after Yellowstone closes. <laughs> now, I, I was going to show you. We have to do this after the park closes, because otherwise they would walk away. Here's part of a field crew, uh, and you can see it's cold. It's like November 11th or so. So there's, there's my crew working away after we've put out some instruments. We have a lot of students graduate students, faculty, and undergraduates. I especially like to involve undergraduates. They get a real kick out of this. They can go to Yellowstone in the winter where there's no tourists. So here's what it looks like installing one of these instruments <clears throat> after a snowfall. So it goes down in this hole and we push it down in. We just walk away. Then we come back a couple of months later and pull it out. If we can find them. <laughs> There is one, guess what that is? That's the orifice of Old Faithful. And you don't get to walk there. I do. <laughs> well, here's putting out instruments in those cold temps. This is the type of array we've put in. Literally hundreds and hundreds of instruments. Each uh, square is an instrument. And you can see we've put in hundreds of instruments on Gibbon Hill, round Old Faithful, clear along the entire Upper Geyser Basin. So we put in up to 300 of these new nodal seismographs. And we have the biggest array that exists in universities to today. That's of course Old Faithful right, right there. And when you do this, you have to be careful. You don't walk close to the edge. We always have Park Service people with us, and you can see the, 
the frost on the real relative features. Walking, this is the boardwalk you guys walk all the time. This is us putting an instrument out. We also record with digital cameras, continuous cameras, the eruptions of geysers. So we have, we have digital cameras running, filming the geysers all the time, and they're synced to the time of the GPS. And this is what that upper geyser basin looks like with the yellow dots are all the instruments and geyser hill. So here's the upper geyser basin, the Old Faithful is right here. And here is Gibbon Hill. Remember those two areas. So when you drive into Old Faithful, this is a, a uh, it's, this is a lidar image uh, showing this is the Old Faithful Inn, the Old Faithful Lodge. And this is the parking lot. We covered it, and yes, we do it after the public is ex is excluded because we put them every 10 to 15 feet. You not only may want to steal them, you have to trip all over them. And this is what we record. So these are seismographs. Well, this is time, four and a half hours, for different instruments. So we're recording the ground motion. And what we discovered, we had no idea it was going to happen, is that we get quite this what we call harmonic tremor. Ground just shakes, dies away, shakes, dies away, shakes, dies away. And they, we can record it on all the instruments. Well, here's the eruptions of Old Faithful. Can you see an eruption in there? If you do, you're doing better than I can. The actual eruptions don't produce hardly any energy because most of the energy is back in the hydrothermal reservoir and the actual eruption is simply a release of hot gas and water. So these are the harmonic tremors in detail and these harmonic tremors precursor an eruption, Old Faithful is here, it's here, I mean I can't see it, but the harmonic tremors are very well defined. So these are precursory tremors preceding an eruption. Given even closer now, these are these ground, the ground is just vibrating, vibrating, then it dies away, and then a little old faithful erupts. And these precursors are 20 to 30 minutes long. And we can map them to a few milliseconds. So here's all the instruments. And I'm just going to plot the direction, principal direction of ground motion. That is, which way is the horizontal ground moving with time? I'm plotting this at an angle, but you can just take it as the horizontal motion. And here's Old Faithful. And what we discovered, totally unexpectedly, all the action's up here. It's not at Old Faithful. We said, what? What's going on up here? That's Gibbon Hill. Well, I'm going to show you some data from Steamboat Geyser that we've just taken in 2018. Here's installing an instrument, and there's an eruption of Steamboat Geyser. So we're allowed to get, again, very close to these systems after the park closes. I'm going to show you, this is data from Geyser Hill, and you can, these are the harmonic tremors. They're totally unrelated to Old Faithful and they have an inter-eruption time 39 seconds, 39, 38, 31, like a clockwork. This is what they look like, whoops. So we see these, and these are two different kinds of seismographs. We get this harmonic tremor, then it just stops. And the eruption of the Old Faithful is over here. And we get these repeating, 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 repeating. So now I'm going to show you that whole idea of ground motion. So here's Geyser Hill, and it pops off with these harmonic tremors. Now what's going on down here? We're close enough to the roads that we're mapping roads, cars, people, etc. So this is anthropogenic noise, 
But the interesting one was this. We had no idea what this source was up on Gibbon Hill. That's right here. Doublet pools, one of these little pools on top of, of that hill on the top. There are the harmonic tremors. And here is doublet pools, not a geyser. It's a hot spring system and it rises and falls and we can map the rise and the fall, the rise and the fall, and you can actually see it. I didn't put a time scale on here. We can see the water coming up to the surface and boiling almost over and then going back down. And when it rises, it emits a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide, CO2, sulfur dioxide, uh, which of course is being released from this very energetic, very active hot spring, not quite a geyser but it emits the same kind of signals. So, <laughs> we, I'm just showing you this. There's our different kinds of instruments and we found out that the instruments here in blue had this very strong signal. Those in green, back over here and on the, next to it, the signal is smaller. And in red, clear over here, is a very tiny signal. So there's a spatial variation in how the signals come across Old Faithful. That was a clue. There's something under Old Faithful that we didn't know about. Well, we put all these seismographs in. Now, let me tell you, if you guys are computer, whoop, you guys are computer 10 terabytes per survey. We have a lot of computational capability, supercomputing. We also put a plate, steel plate on the ground and put a hammer on the plate and record the ground shaking. That's a synthetic source. Again, here we are in front of the Old Faithful Inn with a nodal. That instrument is just over to the right of this picture. Oh, sorry. Whap. So every time he hits the ground, the waves go out and they go clear across Old Faithful and we record them on all the seismographs. Bob, uh, when you had these instruments out? <coughs> Say again? When the instruments were out there and recording, did you have a natural earthquake anywhere in the corridor? Uh, reasonable size? Not really. We, we haven't, we've recorded a few earthquakes, very few. This is not earthquake seismology. This is called active source tomography. Again, putting them out. There we are. So this is... We have 300 of these, so we have to pack them and take care of them <laughs> very, very well. A lot of people borrow them now. I just want to say, this is, this is the ray that we occupy. Each point here is a station we occupied one year. Now, we don't do the whole thing at once. We do a little section 100 yards wide and move to another one and another one. And these are different years, 15 through 16, because we wanted to cover the whole system. This is 2017, so we would put instruments here for two to three days, two to three days, two to, they just move them from right to left as they got covered by snow. These are the hammer throws. That's the actual direction of all the seismic waves, uh, which you know, that's individual. 1,700 hammer swings, the guys who threw the hammer get really tired fast. <laughs> and I don't do it. Now what we discovered was that the seismic velocities shown in this scale right here. Red are the very low velocity, means, means the highest temperatures. Blue is the highest velocity and the coldest temperatures. To the south and northwest, northeast, but Yellowstone itself is low velocity and you can really see a map we can convert seismic waves to temperature we haven't done it quite yet but if you look down just 20 meters below the surface there's this low velocity body there's old faithful you go 10 meters down now we see something shallower and here's at the surface basically and this is what we're seeing right beneath the Old Faithful apron. Gives you an idea of where it's hot. Anyway, 
So these seismic waves are what we use to study the system with. And uh, I just want to compare here Old Faithful signals and Geyser Hill. You can see they look totally different. They're totally different because their plumbing has, is not connected whatsoever. Everybody thinks they are. They go to Old Faithful and walk on Geyser Hill. They say, oh, these are connected. No, they're not. They're independent shallow sources. And I'll show you in a minute where they are. So this is what one of these harmonic signals look like. This is for about 20 minutes. If you zoom in, you see a lot of little ups and downs. And finally, you zoom in to just a few minutes. And you go down to now literally to tens of seconds. And these are all tiny earthquakes. Each one of these is one of these. In other words, this thing's emitting thousands and thousands of earthquakes. And this goes on for weeks and months. And this repeats itself every second. Well, this is just showing, well, two different frequencies. The eruptions of the geysers with time, and I'm going to show you that they're eruptive cycles, and we're just plotting over here. <laughs> you think about this, the actual motion. So it's quiet, and then the ground goes up, and then bang, there's an eruption right here. Ground goes back down, and it goes up. Just think of this, keep this pattern in your mind. These are for different frequencies for the geophysicists. So, this is a time window, and we're plotting the seismic data with time. As you can see, this is about an hour, just a few hours, and we see the, like, we see these seismic emissions getting shallower and shallower and shallower, and then bang, it goes off. So we can actually use this data to map the eruptions. This is for different frequencies and different instruments. This is actually the intensity of the shaking. Very low, there's a peak, then an eruption. But the maximum from energy, as you can see here, is 20 minutes before the eruption. Old Faithful just doesn't have that much in ground shaking. Now we can actually use these repeated data repeat, 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 and we can predict now Old Faithful eruptions to within seconds. <laughs> now what did that ranger say when you're at the Old Faithful Visitor Center? Plus minus 20 minutes? He doesn't have our data, although we've offered it to them, but it's a little <laughs> complex to understand. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to take you down into Old Faithful. This gentleman, Dr. Westfall, was working in, he's a Caltech JPL engineer, and he devised a little television camera that we put down into Old Faithful. I know some of you have seen this, but those that haven't, I think you'll really enjoy this picture. I need a microphone there. Can I put my microphone up against that? John, can't get it off. You're watching Old Facebook for the last few minutes. And I can't get this loud enough without. I'd like to tell you a bit about this video. A small group of scientists from the California Institute of Technology, Arizona State University, and Yellowstone National. Does that help? Have been studying how Old Facebook works in detail. Well, I'll just tell you what he's doing. This is uh, Old Faithful Orifice, and these are eruptions of yellow Old Faithful, and the idea was to come back into here and study the inside of, of Old Faithful. And you do that by lowering a camera, which he's going to show. And uh, this gentleman, this was... I can't hear you. Okay, I know, I took it off. This work we Course, Sorry, the sound isn't synced. We'd like to know where the water comes from. Does it come from size? So he wants, he's asking the question, where does the water come from? No one knew. I mean, everybody would have thought, gee, Old Faithful has been studied for hundreds of hundred years. No, has not. And about a foot wide. You can see down about 10 uh, 
below that we rip and pull around. This is the main eruption, and you notice there's here is the orifice after the water's gone. You don't want to get that close. We have a seismograph just over behind the rock right here, by the way. This is siliceous center. It's the deposits from the mineralized silica that covers the whole ground. And the orifice is not a hole. It's an ellipsoid crack. So here's what he made. Made this TV camera. <laughs> and we embedded the camera in ice to keep it cool enough. On the other hand, ice melts. <laughs> and I'm going to move this ahead a little bit. So he's going down into the orifice. And I know that's just, you can't see it as well, except you can see this elongate feature. That's the conduit. It's about six feet long, two to three feet wide. It's basically controlled by an old fracture. We have no idea what's going to happen. And now you can see now he's going down deeper and deeper now the water is at 22 meters I mean the boiling the top of the reservoir and he's just bouncing along shaking this thing to keep her from not getting caught because it's a pretty expensive piece of equipment even though NASA has lots of money you can see the hot water it's boiling from the surface down and falling onto the instrument. Those are drops of water coming on to you. You may not believe that, but that's true. Down into a much bigger lake, just wildly boiling water, which is boiling out and splashing Now, whoops, he just hit the bottom and we recovered the footage. This footage was lost till two years ago. Professor Westfall had died. We went to his wife and said, we know this must exist somewhere. Nah. So we went through his, a lot of his findings and we discovered it. We digitized it. It's on the web. You can all download it and look at it. So here's our story. This is the anatomy of Old Faithful. Here's Old Faithful itself. This is the boardwalk. This is the boardwalk on the southwest side. There's the Old Faithful Inn. This is the Old Faithful Hydrothermal Reservoir. It's highly fractured rock, 20% voids, which is porosity. And on the very side is this little thing right here called Old Faithful. So it captures the hot fluids and gases and waters from this much bigger feature that underlies much of the upper geyser basin. That's the Old Faithful Reservoir. Old Faithful is just a little release mechanism right here. So in map view, this is, let me go back a little bit here. Uh, what's the difference between the gray and the yellow on that plot? Between what? The difference between the gray and the yellow. Oh, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a cartoon. It's just meant to be wa hot water and solid fractured rocks. We don't know the structure. We just we know it has to be that, that porosity. We know the ratio of the voids compared to the rocks. It's about 30% of hot water. Now this is Old Faithful, but I want to remind you that there are a dozen Old Faithfuls at Old Faithful. So if you were to look, here's an old faithful, here's an old faithful, here's an old faithful, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. These are old faithfuls that eventually clog up and the water from that reservoir moves to somewhere else. So old faithful is very ephemeral. It's only gonna last hundreds to a thousand years. It'll fill up and then something else will break loose. And the reservoir itself reaches clear over here to the southwest. It underlies the Old Faithful Inn, the parking lot, the Old Faithful Lodge. So this reservoir is much, much bigger than the geyser basin. Now, this is going, I'm going to start this movie, and this is a cross section of Old Faithful. These are seismographs. And I'm going to see how the water moves vertically and we're looking at the depth of the top of the reservoir as it rises and bang there's an eruption 
water reservoir rises again. Oops. See it rising? So that's the top of the hydrothermal plumbing of the Old Faithful Geyser. And you can see it's doing it here every, in our case, about 50 minutes. So what we're, ma what we're mapping are several of these cycles of uplift, eruption, return to uplift. So what the actual feature is, this is one we just recently published. Here's that reservoir I showed you before, clear off to the left, but there's a chamber of hot water that rises time T0 goes up and up, T1, it closes down into a narrow conduit, comes up to the surface, and then this boiling finally erupts every 93 minutes or thereabouts. So what we're mapping with this time system is the actual evolution of an individual old faithful eruption. You know, I showed you that. So we're, we're simply mapping from starting down to here. That's this. It's rising, rising, rising up to the lower chamber, upper reservoir, and then bang, it goes off. Now we see no reason why it's going to slow down or stop now. But let me conclude just at the end here. Reminds you Yellowstone <laughs> is a geologic park and I showed you the picture I'd taken of Steamboat Geyser because this epitomizes Yellowstone. Largest geyser in the world. I almost <clears throat> crashed an airplane, lost all my film, but besides that, this is the epitome of, of Yellowstone's hydrothermal systems. The Norris Geyser Basin is the latest experiment we just did. So we've put instruments here at Norris. And this is steamboat up the hill and there's an eruption of steamboat right behind us. Now we do this in the middle of the summer so there's lots of tourists around by the way. And one thing we discovered, there's actually two release areas, one that's high velocity and to the right there's this low velocity red looking fluids which are capturing the center from the side and there are actually two different mechanisms and two different orifices. Okay, Steamboat has erupted 58 times in 16 months. It's been on all kinds of news, reports, TV, etc. There's a list of them all. The eruption interval has decreased from two weeks back in 2018 early now to five to seven days. And it's really been erupting at much higher rates. No one could tell me what the mechanism is. Everybody says, oh, tell us all about what caused it. Well, I published a paper, and I'm sorry, I didn't put the date, back in the 90s. And I showed if you plot pressure in the earth and temperature, this is a cross section. You have hydrothermal water that rises vertically. There's groundwater coming into the side, and there's the water table at a depth of only a few meters, tens of meters. But if you lower the water table, and that is in the summer, you drain the water out, water table goes down, and what happens? Well, if you decrease the water table, you decrease the pressure. So here's the pressure of number one, here's the pressure of number two. So this is the tea kettle, you take the pressure off the tea kettle, blows up. That's what's causing this period, these very predictable now North skies are basin eruptions. Well, just I want to finish off by saying there's been some, I've seen some articles in the local paper, et cetera, about where the Teton Fault goes. The Teton Fault, friends, goes a long way, and I want to first show we created this map of the bathymetry, the water depth of Jackson Lake, and I expected to find in the seismic data that this was the fault, the west side of this deep trough. It was not. So here's a cross section, and I want to, this is from Moran Bay, clear over to, over to Sigla Mountain. 
This is Donahue Point. These are seismic layers. And the fault in our, should have been in our data right here. It wasn't. It was clear over here off of the lake, almost a kilometer west. So the Teton Fault was not associated whatsoever with the formation of the lake. We didn't see it in any of our seismic profiles, and we have about a dozen. So the Teton Fault originates down here. The Teton Range extends north to this quiescent zone, and then it maps up with these act. See, these are earthquake zones that we've mapped very accurately. These are extensions of the Teton Fault, and it goes clear up to Mount Holmes. This is the Gallatin Range. It has a normal fault on it, just like the Teton Range has a normal fault. The Teton Range used to be in here. It got blown away. And you can see from our data, these earthquake zones are very well defined. They're just buried faults, covered with some young lavas. So I do societal things. And uh, that's Old Faithful, and this is a figure showing, these are eruptions in red. Eruption one, two, three, four. This goes, as you can see, for almost 24 hours. This was back in 2016. So at night, there's no one around. They're just the eruptions of Old Faithful. But everybody's back in their bed and in their rooms. And they get up early in the morning, and they start walking around. All these t visitors, they walk around and they get more and more of them, more and more of them. So we're recording all of these people on our seismographs. <laughs> I have a seismogram for every person. Well, what's kind of interesting, of course, is there's the eruptions. If you look closely, the eruptions are followed right behind it by a lot of walking. <laughs> Guess where they're going? to the restroom of the Old Faithful Visitor Center. This correlates exactly with those data. <laughs> so that's my contribution. So the, the Old Faithful source is a big hydrothermal body that you cannot see on the surface, but it's very shallow to the southwest. and It uh, underlies much of the infrastructure of the Old Faithful area. But it's produced by hot fluids that come off this shallow magma reservoir that shallows to the northeast. And if you want to go up and see where it's shallowest, it's Hot Springs Basin. But take along lots of bear spray and have a nice horse. It's 22 miles in. How often and how big are hazards? I'm going to show you a pie chart. Calculate how often something bad happens. And then I'll calculate if you multiply this number times the area it covers. Here's the super eruption. 0.00014% per year. Do you ever worry about that when you get your insurance? <laughs> I hope not. Now in this pie chart, it's 5.6%. The since the last caldera eruption, there's been about 50 small rhyolite flows, and they make up, as you can see, 0.005%. Come on, that's so small you don't care. But you do care about these large hydrothermal eruptions if you're right next to them. The problem is they're very small. They only cover a few square hundred meters, unless you get a very big one. But you can see in this chart, you can't even see it because the risk factor is very low. It's very rare that you'll be next to one of these. But you're going to see a lot of these. The biggest hazard in Yellowstone and Teton are earthquakes, magnitude sevens and larger. 95% of the hazard are big earthquakes. Now, Yellowstone, came into the news a couple of weeks ago when the Ridge Crest earthquake started popping off because everybody said, oh, we're going to trigger Yellowstone. <laughs> well, this is a map through July 9th of this magnitude 7.4 earthquake that occurred near Cyril's Lake. It's about 100 miles back to the San Andreas, which is clear over here. 
And you can see there's a lot of earthquakes over there. 7.4, excuse me, 7.1 is a big earthquake. And it's going to cause probably $100 million in damage. But it was outside of the population area, and here's what it looked like. Is the earthquake started down on this trend off of what's called the Garlock Fault, and they propagated north. Here's the 7.1. There was a magnitude 6.4, and then it came clear up to here. Now, this happens to also be the location of China Lake Naval Air, well, station. It's a very secret place. It's like Area 51. This is further south. So the military, we know, won't tell us, but that base was heavily affected by this earthquake. <laughs> so did Yellowstone get triggered? I mean, that's a long ways to send seismic waves, but we've seen data like this before. It's 900 miles. I really can't say that it's not likely. I say it's highly unlikely, though. Okay, now I get to talk about me, and I'm sure you've seen some of these pictures, guys. This is pre-science. Well, I was a pilot in the U.S. Air Force, first jet class in 1962. Yeah, that's me with more hair. <laughs> but I also, as was introduced, I went to Antarctica with the British Antarctic Survey. And here I am 18 months later, driving a dog team. How many people do you know that have driven a dog team in Antarctica? You know, it's a hairy place back in 1962 and 63. One of the things that we did, this is the little ship we were on. It's a British ice transport, it's not a breaker. We got frozen in clear down along the Palmer Peninsula. We were frozen in for a few days. And the captain said, we got enough food to last a year. And that's when I said, I'm not staying here a year. <laughs> so I called Secretary of State Dean Rusk's office, who was my boss, and I said, we're stuck down here. Talked and talked. A couple of days later, he said, just a, wait a couple of days. Two days later, the USS Glacier, the largest icebreaker in the fleet, it's nuclear powered, sailed clear from McMurdo Sound around Antarctica, came right in front of us, and we followed right behind her. <laughs> and there was never a communication between them. And this was secret until about three years ago because we don't want to embarrass the Brits. Well, I've shown this lots of times. They're doing gravity surveys. These are dolerites and basalts along the again along this Palmer Peninsula. We did have air, we did have snowmobiles and we have aircraft. While we were going down that country, we went through a crevasse. We were all roped up, three of us, and the sledge went across the crevasse, broke it. See those two ropes right there? One's holding me and one's holding the base doctor. The base doctor is at the bottom of the hole looking up. Now he had a compound fracture. He had the guts to pull a camera out and shoot us as we pulled him out. We got him out, shot him full of morphine. Then they put me on top of him, shot me full of morphine, and we traversed back. And it was for this incident that, well, I'll show you. We got the Queen's Medal from the Queen of England and the gold medal and the U.S. Antarctic Medal. By, on the way, by the way, we were in South Georgia. This is the grave Sir Ernest Shackleton. How many here have read his books? If you haven't, you have to. He was this Swiss, excuse me, English person, fellow that came down into Antarctica four different times in the early 1900s and mapped much of the, we call it the Palmer Peninsula, and the surrounding area, and he attempted to go across from to the South Pole, not with much skill because his ship got stuck. There's what we got. That's the medal I got from the United States government, and that's the gold medal from the Queen. I, I still, 
<laughs> I don't ski like this anymore. This is, I'm a, I've been a professor at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, so I was in the mountains all the time. Here we are skiing some beautiful terrain in the middle of the Swiss Alps, skin up early in the morning, and we climb to the top of this peak. Actually, we're right there. And there we are climbing to the top, and you get to the top. You know what the Swiss scientists do? They break out the best white wine there is. <laughs> then you got to ski back down there, which we made. Here's skiing further east in the Swiss Alps. This is getting up there. We shouldn't have been on this slope, but we made it to this Swiss Alpine Club hut and we skied all of these bowls. You can see a lot of our tracks. We skied this bowl for two days. This is skiing a place called Pete's Midel. This peak right here, climbed up, clear up through. There's a glacier right here. And we crossed the glacier right here. By the way, the hut we were at was full of Swiss truck drivers. Once we got across the glacier, all the truck drivers followed us, and here we are at the top of the peak with 20 Swiss truck drivers. <laughs> How many American truck drivers do you know that can climb and ski peaks like this? And here I am on Mount Blanc, the highest peak in Europe. This is Mount Blanc. And we, you take transit to the top, but then you go way off to the left into areas, this is a Guy de Queen, it's called the Shark, and we skied over there down into active <laughs> snow slides that we shouldn't have been at. No, it ain't gonna blow today. I'm gonna finish off with, don't believe everything you read or hear. Yellowstone volcano shock can kill five billion. Yellowstone volcano overdue. Yellowstone volcano and bizarre UFO. Side of Yellowstone warning, big one ahead. Yellowstone volcano, sleeping gorilla. You guys believe this? That's what's in international newspapers today. I mean, this is not old. This is just made up about two weeks ago. No, it is not about to blow. So that's the literal end, and I thank you much. <laughs> Got to wait so I can hear you. Uh, has anybody done a long-term study of the water chemistry coming out of Old Faithful? Major no. Water no. Metals, you would think the USGS, who are the well, there's several universities that are one, including one of our faculty, but they've done, you know, annual sampling, right. but no continuous sampling of the chemistry. And we know it does change because they've done every month or so, and they can see major changes. But the answer is, it really hasn't been done. That's a big hole in the data. Any more questions? Loud. So every time the, uh, one of these guys is a rock, those water runs on the Yep. So how does the reservoir refill? Like, where does the new water connect to the Oh, it's just groundwater. I mean, there's not that much water coming out. There's only about 20,000 gallons that actually flows out into the Firehole River. It's not a big flow, but it's just groundwater from rain and snow melt. It's, back, it's just part of the upper 100 meters of this highly fractured rock. Somebody had a question here? Bob over here. Bob over there. Dr. Smith, uh, were you using your uh, portable recording side of graphs uh -huh. for tomography? Yeah. The, the ones you read. So, what was the time scale? That you, I mean, the time accuracy. Oh, well, we record a thousand samples a second. I mean, the absolute accuracy between the slowest and the fastest, like. You mean the velocities that we? Time difference, uh, you know, like, like. I don't quite understand your question. I mean, the time difference. How, we, how accurate was the time signal for each of the Time Literally within seconds. Yeah, they're all synced together. Yeah, fast? Every, everything synced together with a common signal. Is that fast enough to do this? Oh yeah, because we're, we're sampling a thousand samples a second, yeah. and everything's on. Every instrument's all synced because we take a GPS signal and GPS clock signal. Plus, they have their own internal clocks. Do 
today sample GPS those individual units? Uh, yes, but only single frequency, so we can't use them for locations. We have to use dual frequency. Now that's what we're going to start doing, because I just started making them that way. Uh, one more question on the photo of the ejecti at the Black Pearl Basin or whatever it was. What was the black? What made it black? Oh, that's just the cinder. And you mean of the orifice? Well, no, when you showed the, the, you know, the ejecti coming out of the... Uh, Right, yeah, that's the orifice of the geyser. That's center. Yeah, but it was black. Could it, could well, it's dark gray. It's, uh, it's about as gray as your pants. And it's just the center color when it mineralizes right at the surface. That's the, it's not yellow like Yellowstone. It is very dark brown and black. And then as it metamorphoses with atmospheric contamination, then it will change color back into a yellow, red, etc. But I'm not a geochemist, so. Uh, the big eruption, uh, the biggest one, uh, recent, was 2.1 million years ago. Uh, 2,500 cubic kilometers of sediment. It's interesting that the Arctic Ocean essentially froze over about 2 million put any relationship with potential cooling? <laughs> we've actually, we've all kind of thought about that. What would have been the correlation of these giant eruptions with a global climate change in both poles? And they actually have the best data in, uh, in Antarctica, where they have continuous cores through that period. And the answer is, no one really knows, but it's certainly something that we've all thought about. But I, to my knowledge, it hasn't really been evaluated. But it's been thought about because we just don't have the coral. I mean, did ash really get up there? Well, it had to get in the atmosphere because it, it yeah, you decrease the temperature 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit for several years, you're going to increase and change both the, the climate and the freezing as well. Elizabeth? Uh, on your map, where you showed the tea well, you can only see, you mean on the Teton Fault? Well, you can only see it as far south, uh, j it's just north of Wilson, where the fault is where we've actually mapped it in detail. We've mapped it all the way, you know, we've done this for <laughs> 20, 30 years ago, that going through north, of course, it aligns itself with earthquakes because there's no surface faulting. But it goes right up along those earthquake alignments, which there's several across Yellowstone. They're just old normal faults. They're just covered by these young rhyolites. I was just thinking if I could do a mental ruler from the fault in the middle and then your projections. It goes up to the east side of the Gallatin. There's a ridge of mountains down there and there's a straight line. Well, it's not quite straight, but that's how I made it. <laughs> it goes in the east, it aligns itself with the Gallatin Fault. So the Gallatin and the Teton were connected. She's and they, ask how far south does the Teton Fault go? Well, only just down to Wilson. We can only see it south, just north of the road, the, the pass road. Because then there's a Laramide thrust plate that comes up from the south, and it the, the normal falls on the north side of the thrust plate. It's a laramide thrust, but, but it's contained the Teton Fault. Of course, the question is, why is the Teton Fault on the east side of the range? Everywhere else, except for the Wasatch, most of the faults are on the west side of the range. Don't know. So that's an, the Teton Fault is very unusual, and we don't know the details of how it actually evolved. We just know the stresses that created it. Now, <laughs> you showed a progression of the hot spot, and you know, millions and right. thousands of years. Right, centers the hot spot. It, it looks like it's slowing down. Is it running into? Something? Um, I've got that all published. I got to go back. It is slowing down. It was it was greatest high rate? It's going about two to three. Well, it's going an inch per year. At the beginning, it was going an inch and a half per year. Now it's down to less than an inch per year. That is the the effect of the plate motion on the 
surface. It, it is slowing down. The plate isn't slowing down, but the actual probably volume coming in is slowing down, a volume of magma. It has to come clear from the Earth core mantle boundary, and it could change with time. That was, that's our one explanation. Uh, two questions. Uh, the projection of the Teton fall, how close does it get to Mar Mars geyser basin if you were to project it up there? It is very, well, it's very close to the Norris Geyser Basin. So that's the Galveston, that's the Norris Corridor, where that, that's the Galveston Fault. The Galveston Fault is intersected by the east-west zone of earthquake. The earthquakes we see in Yellowstone, the Norris, are all aftershocks of the Heavy Lake earthquake. I didn't show you that. But the majority of the seismicity are aftershocks of the Heavy Lake earthquake. They're going to last for hundreds of thousands of years. So the dominant seismicity in Yellowstone is not volcanism. It's aftershocks of this magnitude 7.3 Heavy Lake earthquake. And they'll go on for a hundred years. So I've got, we've, we've, I have figures of all that. So the answer is, it's very close. It goes right through Norris. Well, thanks guys. And <laughs>